lecture series. Today's speaker is Professor Eric Morris of Princeton University in South Carolina. Yes. Uh, in addition to his research on urban transportation history, which we're going to hear about today, Professor Morris is arguably the nation's leading scholar on the links between transportation and time use, access, activity patterns, and life satisfaction. There are he, he's, he studies He studies happiness and transportation. He also studies social and policy implications of shared mobility and connected autonomous transportation. Uh, Professor Morris is an accomplished writer beyond the academy. He wrote a column on transportation for the New York Times for several years. And prior to becoming an academic, he worked as a travel writer, a sports writer, and a television writer and producer. His writing credits include Let's Go Travel Guides, the TV shows Jag, Star Trek Voyager, and Xena, the Warrior Princess. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming the multi-talented Eric Morris back <laughs> to this tonight, where I'll be speaking today on where to put the port, the free harbor fight, and the development of Los Angeles. Eric Morris. Thank you so much. Thanks for all coming out on a Friday. I know the free food probably helped uh, more of a draw than my talk today, um, but I super appreciate you all being here, um, especially because we're going to talk about something having to do with Los Angeles. So I think it'll be uh, interesting to those of you who aren't familiar with the this part of the history of the region. And the title of my talk today is Life's a Beach, um, The Free Harbor Fight and the Historical Development of Los Angeles. Now, all of you are quite familiar, I'm sure, with the geography of the region. And you're familiar with, with Santa Monica. Um, if I was uh, an independently wealthy uh, person, this is where I would have lived when I was going to school here. Instead, I ended up in the valley. But um, <laughs> as we know, very attractive area. Um, aesthetically pleasing, shop, great shopping, restaurants, um, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the median home prices match the level of amenities that you get in Santa Monica, 1.65 million. Um, and of course, here's the aesthetics of the pier and all that. We'll talk about that later. Um, the aesthetics of the Port of Los Angeles down in San Pedro and Long Beach are a little different. Um, if you are a transportation geek, this might be an incredibly beautiful picture for you to look at. Probably for your typical citizen, not as much so. Um, I'm trying to make a case about the difference in the median home prices, but look at what's going on with your uh, prices in your metropolitan area. $626,000 to look out your window at this. Um, um, still a highly expensive area, but obviously it's not um, Santa Monica. And of course, the major difference is that San Pedro is located um, in, in the port area. Um, some of you might be familiar with the ports a little bit, have done some research about them, and you probably know much of this. But um, Los Angeles and its sister port in Long Beach are the third busiest container port uh, in the world. 23% um, of the nation's waterborne cargo goes through the port of Los Angeles, mostly full ships coming from Asia and empty ships going back to Asia. Um, the ports are huge. They sprawl across 15 square miles. And when you count all of the, the, the curves and all of that, um, there are over 40 miles of waterfront um, just in the port of Los Angeles alone. Um, creates a tremendous number of jobs. Now, if you ask the ports, um, uh, they create 350,000 jobs. Um, that counts uh, the IT people who work at UCLA because indirectly, uh, you know, the ports are, are supporting all of us. Um, so I would say 350,000 jobs. But um, logistics is one of the biggest industries in the Southern California region. Um, I've read second biggest employer after tourism. And the ports have been growing at a rapid rate. However, um, the irony is that Los Angeles has no natural harbor. Um, competitor cities on the West Coast, San Diego, San Francisco, Seattle, are all blessed with terrific natural harbors. Um, Los Angeles had none. Um, everything that we have in terms of uh, our huge logistics industry, shipping industry, and all of that was created by mankind from whole cloth. And the story we're going to talk about today is how that was done and the implications of that uh, uh, for the region. Um, OK, we're going to have a little audience participation today. Um, a gold star will be awarded to the person who can tell me why it was so essential for Los Angeles to construct a port. Now, of course, all cities like to have a port or whatever. But there's one specific re reason why this region desperately needed a port. So think in terms of goods that might be imported or exported. And in the early years of Los Angeles, um, what might that reason be? Yes, sir. Exporting oil? 
We're going to talk about that. That comes a little bit later, and that is huge. But and that's an excellent guess. But that's not until I'll have it on my slides. Like 1924, I think they struck oil on Signal Hill. Um, anyone else have a guess? Yes, sir. Fruit. Fruit is also an excellent guess. Um, I'm sure that was a super important export. But there was something that was even super more important. Yes, ma'am. Defense. Defense spending is important, as we're going to see. Um, the port at San Pedro would employ 20,000 people during World War I doing um, shipbuilding, um, but that was also a little later. This is something that was, that was super important super early. OK, I'm going to come back to it. OK. Um, would it be the desire to provide cargo for the railroads? Desire to provide cargo for the railroads. Um, uh, sort of. You can try to. That's the political reason. Um, we'll talk about the railroads coming up. Yeah, yes, sir, Rick. Someone said Congress? No. Um, what party? Coal. Coal? Gold. Gold? Uh, not in this part of the state. Also, you wouldn't really need a railroad for that, right? Your little bag of gold can easily fit in your pocket, <laughs> and uh, you could transport that. Professor Wax, do I see you? Well, that's, that's not a complete. The, the, the supply of the gold. Rush. Right. Of course, that's what made San Francisco. I don't know if you see the population of San Francisco went from like 2,000 people to 70,000 people in two years as a result of the, uh, the gold rush. Anyone else? One. Cattle ranching? Cattle ranching? No. Um, that's a good guess also. Most of the land we see around us was, was all ranches originally, including Santa Monica. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, let me, let me go on. We'll, we'll, we'll learn about it. Okay, this is. What San Pedro used to be um, in the 1800s. Um, that's it. That's the port of LA. There's been a little bit of transformation between this picture and, and the prior one. San Pedro had always been the port for Los Angeles. Um, however, it had severe problems. So it's not really sheltered. You know, it's not like San Francisco where you sail around the peninsula, you've got a nice sheltered bay. Um, there, there's no sort of uh, shelter from winds and waves. Second of all, water is extremely shallow. So to bring goods in and out of Los Angeles, um, you would either have to anchor the ship several miles out and then transfer all the cargo into rowboats and then row it ashore and then take it off the boats and carry it up a steep slope. The other option is to beach the ship, but that's extremely difficult and dangerous. Also, the bottom here is mud flats, so it made it very difficult to build structures out into the water. So if you build a pier, it would sink, the pilots would sink into the um, 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 sea. Um, here are quotes from a, a writer, a 19th century writer named Richard Henry Dana, who um, wrote a well-known um, travelogue. He worked as a sailor on ships plying the Pacific coast. And he said, San Pedro, they told me, was a worse harbor than Santa Barbara, being so shallow that the sea broke out broke often as far out as where we lay at anchor. Moreover, it possessed hills so steep for taking up goods and stones so hard to our bare feet. On another trip, he said, for great joy, we did not have to anchor at San Pedro. And on a further trip back, he said, here, I was back at this most hated, thoroughly detested spot. Um, there were improvements made uh, in like the 1870s by this man, Phineas Banning. I don't know for sure, but maybe the Banning, California is named after him. Um, he dredged a channel so that you could bring the ships closer into shore and built an port at Wilmington, so that was a little bit um, inland. Um, but even though the port facilities had been improved, um, that still left the problem of land transportation. So as we know, um, San Peter is 25 miles from Los Angeles, and um, it's extremely difficult to bring lots of heavy goods um, from the port uh, to the city over dirt tracks that were rutted and, and difficult and turned into mud um, um, in the winter. Um, the 25 mile uh, wagon ride was actually slower than walking. So the city needed a railroad between San Pedro and Los Angeles. And they created one, built one in 1868. However, this was to bring a new set of problems. Uh, oops, sorry in the form of this man. Um, this is Hollis P. Huntington. Um, he is, in a sense, owed a debt of gratitude from all of us because he's one of the, quote, big four, along with Leland Stanford and who are the other two of the big four? Does anyone know? Charles Conker. 
Crocker? Yeah. And, uh, and Mark Hopkins. Okay, great. Um, they built the Transcontinental Rail Link, connecting San Francisco with, uh, with the rest of the country. So in a sense, we owe Collis Huntington a um, considerable debt. However, um, for the most part, he was not to do the city of Los Angeles any favors. He's not even the guy who gave us the money for the Huntington Library. That was his nephew. Um, so he basically, <laughs> he basically did very little good for us. He owned the Southern Pacific Railroad. And the Southern Pacific Railroad was building the line between Yuma, Arizona, and I forget the terminus in California. But anyway, it was going to pass 140 miles away from Los Angeles. Now, in this era, not being connected to the rail network was a municipal death sentence. Um, cities that the railroad skipped uh, evaporated and, and flew away like dust. Cities that were on the rail network thrived. And so the citizens of Los Angeles were desperate to get uh, Huntington to build the rail line here. Um, his demands were very steep. So he demanded $600,000, doesn't seem like a lot in today's dollars, but at the time it was 5% of the assessed valuation of all the land in Los Angeles County. <laughs> Um, he demanded all sorts of free land for his right-of-way, for his depots, for his facilities, and he demanded that ownership of the railroad between Los Angeles and San Pedro be turned over to him. And the citizens of Los Angeles were over a barrel, they needed the railroad, and so they agreed to these uh, extortionate terms. Um, once he had control of the rail line between Los Angeles and San Pedro, um, Huntington was a monopolist with a chokehold over the commerce of the city. Um, he charged sky-high rates, so the, the passenger fare in today's dollars was um, over $50 to travel 25 miles between Los Angeles and San Pedro. It actually cost less to ship the goods from Hong Kong to San Pedro than it cost to take them overland between San Pedro and Los Angeles. He even practiced um, the dream of every capitalist, uh, price discrimination. Um, he would charge the maximum to each shipper possible based not on what they were shipping, but how deep their pockets were and how much they could afford. And he would even demand to inspect the books of companies that wanted to ship goods on the railroad so that he could determine exactly how much he could wring out of every um, um, potential customer. Um, that brings Santa Monica into the picture. Um, the land was originally owned by the Sepulveda family, a name you should probably be familiar with. And it was bought by um, um, Colonel Baker and Senator Jones in 1872. Senator Jones was actually a senator from Nevada, uh, but he mostly lived in California. And he owned silver mines in Nevada. And he was looking for a way to break Huntington's stranglehold on the commerce of the city um, by constructing an alternate rail line to Santa Monica and an alternate port in Santa Monica. So, I don't have the graphic here. I forgot to put the slide in. But anyway, in 1872, Santa Monica was created from whole cloth and it had just been empty ranch land. Um, they subdivided the lots, um, sold them off to people. Um, and within one year, a uh, town, this is an artist rendering, here it is, the town of Santa Monica, when it was first founded in the 1870s. And within nine months, it grew to 1,000 people. Um, Jones constructed a railroad between downtown and Santa Monica called the LA and Independence. It opened up in 1875. And he also built this wharf. Sorry about the poor quality of the picture. Obviously, I had to um, scan these in. But um, this is the wharf that he built um, um, in Santa Monica. We're going to talk about what those buildings are coming up. So now LA has two dueling ports, one at Santa Monica and one at San Pedro. But again, why? OK, I'm going to give you some hints. This item was an import, the item that was so important for us to have import here in Los Angeles. What did Los Angeles need so badly in order to succeed as a city? Yes, sir. <laughs> Are we raising our hand? I yeah. Think, yeah. Um, water? Water's obviously a huge issue. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Uh, lumber? Lumber, thank you. 98% of all incoming cargo uh, was lumber because Los Angeles has, uh, by the way, did this help you? Uh, I gave you clues. How about this right here? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, no one's paying attention to my talk. Uh, yeah, there's no, there's no forest here. There's no sources of lumber. So the entire city had to be built on lumber, shipped down the coast from the Pacific Northwest, and um, the population is booming during the late decades of the uh, uh, 19th century. And therefore, um, LA was a huge lumber port. We'll talk about that more coming up. 
Um, okay. Okay. So now we have two dueling ports. So what happens next? Um, standard robber baron practice, and hunting, uh, you might have heard the term robber baron for so sort of like 19th century capitalist. Um, I even looked it up on Wikipedia to see if it had a picture of Huntington literally on the Wikipedia <laughs> article. It did not, but um, anyway, classic robber baron. So here's what they would do when they had, uh, robber barons were novelists, like we've seen with Huntington. Um, if they have a competitor, the strategy is to crush him by cutting your prices down to almost nothing and running the competitor out of business because hopefully you have deeper pockets than him. So on the first day that the new rail link to Santa Monica was, was, was open, Huntington cut his prices by 50%, and then cut them further. Also, he threatened, so this, Huntington was a rail magnate nationwide, the, the Southern Pacific. He threatened that anyone who used the port at Santa Monica would be refused access to his rail networks in the rest of the country. Um, as a result of this, um, the LA and Independence, the railroad going to Santa Monica, quickly crashed and burned and went out of business. Um, only to be bought by this man, Collis P. Huntington, um, <laughs> who immediately shut down the railway, ripped out the wharf, and now he has his monopoly again. His own advisors were like, this is too evil. We can't do this. Like, everyone's going to complain that you're a monopolist, but Huntington didn't care because he was a monopolist. So they, they tore down the wharf. Santa Monica was devastated. Within months, the population dropped from 1,000 people to 350 people. Um, there was one good uh, result of this, though, which is that the remaining citizens <laughs> did find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so fast forward 10 years later. Um, the Santa Fe Railroad had come to Los Angeles, so there was now a competing railroad to the Southern Pacific serving the, the metropolitan area as a whole. And the Santa Fe and other railroads were exploring building a rail link from an, an alternate rail link from Los Angeles to San Pedro. Um, um, as you know, the terrain is not particularly um, difficult between downtown and San Pedro, and there's plenty of room to build uh, competing rail facilities. Um, at the same time, though, um, the port at San Pedro was uh, uh, deficient for reasons that we talk about later, I mean earlier. It required a huge amount of work in order to make it into a serious port. So for example, because it was too shallow, it could handle coastal shipping, um, but it was not good for handling the increasing trans-Pacific trade in which you had bigger ships with, with a, a bigger draft. Um, so lots of work was needed. They needed a new breakwater, they needed dredging, they needed things like that. It promised to be extremely expensive, um, and uh, um, without this investment, San Pedro couldn't thrive. So Huntington came up with an alternate plan to try to preserve his monopoly. Um, he still owned the rail line from Los Angeles to Santa Monica, and in a deal of land um, in Santa Monica itself. Um, specifically in Santa Monica Canyon, two miles north of the town. And he extended his rail line from the town of Santa Monica up to this secluded point a couple miles north of, of the city. Um, the idea is that he wants to build a new port in Santa Monica, not San Pedro, turn that into Los Angeles' port, and he'll have a monopoly of it forever. This is the route, as you can see. Um, no room for competing tracks here. If he can get Santa Monica to be to, to get the investment to be Los Angeles's harbor, he will forever uh, control the route. Um, the New York World said is the entire extent is as exclusive as though it were surrounded by a Chinese wall. So he did a lot of improvements. This is a tunnel he blasted through the bluffs at Santa Monica. Um, this building here is the Hotel Arcadia, which we're going to talk about um, um, coming up. Um, and he built what's called the Long Wharf. Um, which uh, was an engineering marvel at the time. Um, 5,290 foot piles had to be sunk 10 to tw uh, 20 feet into the ocean floor. Here's a picture of it, um, almost a mile long, one of the longest wooden wharfs in the world. Why did it have to be so long? Can anyone guess? Yes. Uh, I used to sail quite a bit in the area. And okay. It gets pretty rough when you get to the shore, so it's to sort of get a little bit away from the coastline there. I didn't realize that, and I haven't sailed uh, in the area. Um, also, the water shell, so you have to go far out in order to be able to accommodate ships. Anyway, huge coal bunker uh, built uh, at the end. Um, 
Um, all sorts of buildings were constructed on the Long Wharf. Uh, way out at the end, it had uh, kitchens and dining rooms. It even had sleeping quarters for the people who worked out there because it was a mile walk just to get back to shore from the end of the wharf. He even built a town called Port Los Angeles with stores, depots, uh, even a dance pavilion. Um, Santa Monica opened as a port. Um, people thronged to uh, uh, see the ships arrive, and over 300 ships would dock at this uh, competing port in Santa Monica over the next few years. However, the people of Los Angeles were not ready to give up yet. There's still a chance that they can get the investment to be made in San Pedro and have the port there instead of in Santa Monica. And this opened up what's called the Free Harbor Fight, um, in which Los Angeles was <coughs> bitterly divided about which direction to go and, and where the port would be located. Um, the large majority of people, as far as we can tell, supported San Pedro. There could be competing rail links, and you could truly have a competitive port, as opposed to a port that's so secluded that only Huntington can, can control the approaches. Um, Chamber of Commerce voted 328 to 131 in favor of putting the port at San Pedro <coughs> and not Santa Monica. Um, the LA Times was very vociferously pro um, um, uh, uh, San Pedro, as were the Hearst Papers. Um, pretty much the entire California political delegation of elected officials all favored San Pedro. Um, government engineers who surveyed the, uh, the two sites also tended to go for San Pedro. These people founded uh, what, what's called the Free Harbor League. And there were all sorts of uh, rallies and, and protests, et cetera, lobbying for San Pedro. On the other side, you have Huntington and the Octopus. That was the name for Huntington's political machine because his tentacles stretched everywhere in the country, not just in California, um, but throughout the country. Of course, interest in Santa Monica, people who live there and the newspapers in Santa Monica were in favor of the investment going to Santa Monica. Um, and ironically enough, Senator Jones. Remember, he's the one who built the original rail link between Los Angeles and Santa Monica and was run out of business and crushed by Huntington. But he still owns a lot of land in Santa Monica, and he figures he'll become extremely wealthy if the port is put there. So in the case of economics making strange bedfellows, Senator Jones and, and Huntington now become allies. Although, Senator Jones' wife wrote in a letter to him that Huntington ought not to be trusted farther than you can see him. Beware of them as I would of a snake. Um, so that's, his al that's what his allies have to say about him. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what his enemies have to say in a second. Um, there were considerable advantages for San Pedro. As you can see, better approach, holding ground, better water supply, um, better shelter, more defensible, um, et cetera. Um, Huntington tried to claim, yes, sir? So e even in this fight, though, the whole time Huntington still owns San Pedro or the approach? He still has all sorts of operations at San Pedro. And as I'm about to say, this is one of the, uh, uh, give me one second, I'll get back to that. Um, Huntington claimed, oh, there's room for other sets of tracks. Other people can, can build there and compete with me. Um, but any new tracks would have to cross his tracks so, and would require considerable takings along the beach. Um, he claimed he would let his tracks be used by other companies, but as it turned out, the Santa Monica City Council, which he controlled, could revoke those uh, uh, licenses. Um, also, Huntington's monopolistic behavior in the past did not lend people a lot of confidence. As we've seen, he's been um, 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 harassing the city of Los Angeles for years. Also, a whole other story, uh, he had been extremely extortion in his dealings in Northern California. And then the other question is why, when 15 years ago, he declared that Santa Monica was a bad site and had it shut down, is he suddenly saying that it's a much better place to put it is in Santa Monica, even though he has all these operations down in, in San Pedro. So if it wasn't to create a monopoly, it was hard to explain why he's suddenly supporting this new site um, um, in Santa Monica. Here's an editorial from the LA Times. Um, um, Carlos P. Huntington, oh, this is in response to a proposal, Huntington Fuller proposal where San Pedro would get a little bit of money for a few improvements and then his site in Santa Monica would get like a huge amount of money. Um, according to the LA Times, Carlos P. Huntington is so successful in controlling newspapers of the venal sort, individuals with itching palms, state legislatures, congressional committees, boards of supervisors of a certain ilk, 
that with immediate gall, he now makes a bold and barefaced attempt to bribe an entire community. Was ever such effrontery in the history of corporate audacity and impudence? Was ever such a piece of work before attempted or even thought of? We doubt it. Are the citizens of Los Angeles slaves and curs that they should permit themselves to be whipped into line by Collis P. Huntington? Is this a community of free and independent American citizens, or are we the vassals of a bandit, creatures open to bribery, slaves to a pu plutocratic master who has neither bowels of compassion, common decency, nor an organ in his putrid carcass so great as his gall? <laughs> the devil is just as sly in the person of old Huntington as in the person of Mep Mephistopheles himself. Um, this person could get a job as a commentator for Fox News, I think. Um, okay. Um, who's going to pay for all these improvements? It has to be the federal government. It's too much money. Um, federal government came out to inspect. Um, this is committee chairman William B. Fry. Um, I won't read all of this, but uh, Commerce Committee, Senate Commerce Committee chairman. He came and looked and said, well, as near as I can make out, you asked the government to create a harbor for you almost out of whole cloth. The Lord has not given you much to start with, that is certain. It will cost four to five millions to build. Well, is your whole country worth that much? It seems you made a big mistake putting your city in Los Angeles, and he helpfully suggested that everyone should move down to San Diego, where a harbor already uh, existed. Um, ultimately, the battle went to Washington um, to secure this, this federal appropriation. Um, Huntington personally traveled to the Capitol to lobby for the money to be uh, given to make the improvements at Santa Monica. Here's a quote from a newspaper at the time. The harbor contest at Los Angeles waxes warmer. C.P. Huntington was seen going the rounds of hotels today, and he made no halt in buttonholing senators. Four days ago, there was a decided majority in the Commerce Committee to follow the wishes of the two senators from California, which is to put it in San Pedro. But the arrival of Mr. Huntington at the Capitol is now a matter of great doubt where the majority will be found. There is serious speculation in the minds of many as to the means that Mr. Huntington may have used to bring about this, this change. So he was widely believed to be bribing or maybe blackmailing Senate Commerce Committee members uh, in order to, to uh, uh, support his, his uh, location. And in the end, the Commerce Committee reversed itself and voted 9 to 6 to, to put the uh, investment in Santa Monica. Um, the day was saved by this man. Um, Senator Stephen White of California. Um, to give you an example of how widespread the octopus was, he used to work for Huntington and the octopus when he was a lawyer, um, but he gave in to the will of his constituents who all overwhelmingly wanted the facility in San Pedro. Um, in a two-day impassioned presentation on the floor of the whole Senate, he made the case for putting the investment in San Pedro and managed to sway enough people that a compromise was ultimately decided on, which is that um, a, a new board, yet another board of government engineers would survey the two sites and make the decision. <laughs> and that board selected unanimously um, San Pedro. Um, the city celebrated. There were parades, fireworks, rallies, speeches, um, things like that. There's a statue of this man, Senator White, in San Pedro to this day. Um, extremely consequential moment for the city of Los Angeles, as we'll talk about. Uh, according to the LA Times, this is undoubtedly the most important event in Los Angeles and Southern California since the arrival of the Santa Fe system. It would be difficult to exaggerate the importance of this decision to Los Angeles and Southern California. The location of the government Deepwater Harbor marks the beginnings of a new and marvelous era for Los Angeles and Southern California. By the way, I've seen it said that the LA Times' preeminent position uh, among newspapers in Los Angeles began as a result of the fact that it fought so hard uh, in the Free Harbor fight for San Pedro, and then it became extremely popular with the citizens um, as a result. Um, OK, what happens next? Well, um, we've already seen the outcome, but um, Santa Monica was down but not out. Um, subsequent to losing the port and the Deepwater Harbor, um, the town reinvented itself. Senator Jones still owned a lot of land there, and he set about an advertising and marketing campaign to sell the city not as a major you know, industrial uh, waterfront, but, but as a pleasure resort. Um, we've looked at this building before. This was the beginning of Santa Monica as a resort, the Hotel Arcadia. It was constructed in 1886-87, had all sorts of amenities, dining rooms and reading rooms and restaurants and uh, uh, 
elevators and hot and cold running water, which were quite a luxury in those days. Uh, a long flight of stairs down to the water, and had uh, the first roller coaster in Los Angeles, which was gravity powered and moved um, slower than uh, 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 walking. Um, <laughs> other thing that, that were started to be found along the coast in Santa Monica were bathhouses. So in those days, people did sometimes swim in the ocean, um, but they didn't like it. First of all, as we know, the water is pretty chilly here. Second of all, in the Victorian era, it was not considered seemly to appear in front of other people in a wet bathing suit. So people would actually come down to the coast to not go in the ocean, but to go in these bathhouses with swimming pools and, and bathtubs and uh, all sorts of other things, too. They would have restaurants and, and billiard rooms and um, things like that. Um, a couple decades later, um, Santa Monica became the, the site of lots of Tony Beach clubs. So there was an era where, where the whole beach was, or much of the beach was, was taken up by these fancy clubs that would have dinners and parties and, and private beach and things like that. By the 1920s, much of the Hollywood crowd was moving from Beverly Hills and Hollywood um, down to the beach at, at Santa Monica. Here you can see Cary Grant and Mae West. You can see a list of some of the stars. There's a picture of one of the, of one of the beach clubs. Um, the most remarkable um, um, uh, uh, resident was William Hack Randolph Hearst's mistress, Marion Davies, um, for whom he built a spectacular mansion um, um, on the waterfront. Here it is. Oh, no, wait. This is the guest house for the spectacular <laughs> mansion. Here's the spectacular uh, mansion. Um, 118 rooms, 55 bathrooms, um, 37 t uh, fireplaces. As those of you who have been to Hearst Castle know, Hearst would like go to Europe and buy entire castles and ship the entire contents um, to his home. <laughs> In today's dollars, it cost $94 million um, to build this sumptuous pile. What happened to the Long Wharf? Uh, that's all that was left of it. Um, it used to stretch out from here, and today it's all gone, although I was just being told there's still a plaque down at the beach saying this is the site of the Long Wharf. Yes? Yeah, they, have, uh, they have a couple of planks from the old Long Wharf still there, and they have tracks, and so this is where the Long Wharf used to extend out. I haven't been down there. I'll yeah. have to go. Cool. Um, it's near the lifeguard station. You know where else? There is the Long Wharf lives on. Um, can anyone guess? I know I'm, it's sort of a cryptic question. Um, the next step in uh, uh, the evolution of the waterfront was new piers being built in Santa Monica and point southward. But now they were not wharves; they were pleasure piers. And here's a picture of Santa Monica Pier, and this is getting back to my question. This is literally built on the piles from the Long Wharf were removed and brought down further south to build the um, Pleasure Piers. Um, first Pleasure Piers in 1895. Um, obviously, the founding of Venice in 1905, there's a lot more piers. Um, and as we know, they feature amusement park rides and ballrooms and uh, picnic grounds, bandstands, things like that. Of course, the only one still around today is the Santa Monica Pier. But I think at its peak, there were something like 15 pleasure piers along the coast, mostly more towards the south, towards Venice, but some in Santa Monica. What happens to San Pedro? Well, um, in 1901, the Los Angeles Herald reported, this is even before the breakwater was completed, never before has business been so, so bustling down here with the breakwater work, hundreds of men from all over town. Um, at the last, the much looked for era of prosperity has arrived. Um, the breakwater was built, finished in 1911 at a cost of uh, 75 million in, in today's dollars. And it's two miles long, and you can see uh, uh, how impressive of a structure it is. Um, um, in addition to building the breakwater, they did lots of other improvements, dredging the harbor, things like that. The Port of LA's sister port, the Port of Long Beach, was founded in 1907. Um, and a lot of the earth that they got from, from doing dredging was subsequently used for fill to create more land uh, for facilities along the um, waterfront. Primary drivers were fishing, San Pedro was a major fishing port, and the enormous lumber import business, which we've talked about, LA would become the largest lumber port in the nation. Um, to finish up the story of Collis P. Huntington, he wasn't done yet. Um, his grand plan to put the, the harbor in Santa Monica hadn't come to fruition, um, but he still controlled a lot of San Pedro and immediately set about trying to squash competition um, um, at, at San Pedro Harbor. Um, constructing facilities that were designed to block 
uh, other rail lines from, from accessing the harbor, um, which again raised the complaints about his monopolistic behavior. It wasn't until 1913 that the California Supreme Court ruled that almost all of the waterfront should be taken over by the state and become a uh, public uh, property and public trusteeship. Um, someone asked about this already. Um, a major spur to the development of the area was the discovery of oil. That's uh, Signal Hill, just immediately north of Long Beach. Um, it happened between 1904 and 1906. So in 1904, they exported 14,000 bar barrels of oil. By 1906, it was 235,000 uh, barrels of oil. Um, further spur to development came with the annexation of San Pedro into Los Angeles. Um, this opened the door for major new sources of finance to expand the port, various ways in which the city invested in, in the port. Also, those of you who have seen Chinatown know that water is always an issue here. And for many of the communities, not just San Pedro, that were annexed into Los Angeles, it was access to the city's fresh water supply um, that, that, that was the attraction. And there was a stick as well as a carrot. Um, the city of Los Angeles threatened that if San Pedro wouldn't agree to be annexed, um, they would build their own new competing port. Um, and by the way, most of you probably know this, but if you ever wondered where this comes from, um, that was because the port had to be geographically um, contiguous with the city. So they annexed what was called the shoestring, a 16 mile, uh, very narrow stretch of land, just so that this can now be annexed um, um, to the rest of the city. Um, further stimulus for the development of the ports was the opening of the Panama Canal, which as you can imagine, now makes it possible uh, to ship from the east coast uh, uh, to the west coast. So between 1920, 1909 and 1920, tonnage at the ports more than tripled, and 75% of, of the port's cargo passed through the canal. There you can see a picture of one of the locks being built. Um, the doubling the length of the breakwater, et cetera, et cetera. Last major um, um, improvement in this era was the completion of the Cerritos Channel, which functionally interlinked the ports. For those of you who are not familiar, um, Port of Los Angeles and Port of Long Beach are under separate management and are competitors with each other, but are also collaborators with each other as well. So they might compete with each other in terms of you know, prices and making facilities available to shippers, but they'll also collaborate on things like dealing with environmental concerns. We'll talk about that more coming up. <coughs> um, another major spur to the powerful growth and, and dominance of the Port of Los Angeles was the development of the shipping container. Um, for those of you not familiar with this, the humble idea of taking goods and putting them in uniform sized boxes when you ship them had incredibly revolutionary effects on world trade. It's, it's almost, I don't have the statistics here, it's almost impossible to overstate how much quicker and easier and cheaper it made to load ships and unload them when it was all in boxes that stacked nicely together, as opposed to when they had to uh, do things in bulk. I, I've had the statistics, it's like, you know, it would have taken three weeks to unload and load a ship without the containers, and uh, you could do it in a day with everything being containerized. This is a picture of the very first container ship, and this is the first shipment of uh, shipping containers in 1956. Um, LA was a leader in, the ports of, of San Pedro Bay were leaders in terms of adopting con containerization um, for a number of reasons. Um, essentially, the biggest ports had a head start in containerization because they had enough trade to make it worthwhile to adopt new technologies. Um, um, and they had access to capital. Moreover, uh, Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach were, along with New York, among the uh, few ports with a really, uh, along with New York, I just said that, with um, um, uh, advanced planning process. And so Los Angeles and Long Beach were, were very early adopters of containerization. Well, containerization, of course, was, was wildly successful, and that just created a positive feedback loop. Um, where more traffic went to the ports that had containerized early, and that made them more and more dominant. Um, and so today in North America, in part due to containerization, the largest 10 ports handle almost all, uh, I'm sorry, almost half of the uh, uh, shipping by, by volume. Oops, sorry. Um, other factors in the ports rise might be the fact that the ports compete with each other. So I can't really make any conclusions, I haven't really studied it, but my guess would be that um, the fact that the ports are, are next to each other and competing 
may have resulted in more innovation, better service, lower prices for customers, things like that. But as I said, they also um, um, collaborate in terms of things like pollution, security, and, and infrastructure. Um, one more factor that has made the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach so dominant is the weather. Um, you can have operations conducted virtually 365 days a year. Um, the upshot is that while initially those other cities with great natural ports like Seattle and Oakland were competitors with Los Angeles, uh, by 2013, when I last did these statistics, um, Oakland and Seattle carried about four, handled about 4,000 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent containers, Port of, of Los Angeles and Long Beach almost four times as much traffic. So very much the Port of Los Angeles has become the, and Long Beach have become the dominant ports on the West Coast, despite not having any uh, 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 natural um, characteristics that would have suggested originally that Los Angeles would be the shipping center of, of the West Coast and not those other cities. However, a case that I would like to make is that none of this was foreordained. So just as Santa Monica could have been the location of Los Angeles' Deepwater Harbor, um, it's equally possible that San Pedro and Long Beach could have been its pleasure resort. So in around 1900, Notwithstanding the fact that Santa Monica also had recreational facilities, the toniest beach resort in Los Angeles was Terminal Island. Um, if any of you have ever been to Terminal Island, that might be hard to believe, but here's a picture of it in 1900. Um, um, it had a yacht club, bathhouses, picnic tables, observatory, electrically lit boardwalk. There were special trains bringing wealthy people from Los Angeles down to weekend at uh, uh, Terminal Island. Um, luxury hotels, lots of homes for wealthy people uh, on, on Terminal Island as well. Um, here's a picture of a hotel in San Pedro. Um, Long Beach also was a, a, a pleasure resort. Um, um, there's an amusement zone called the Pike. Um, Brian, you're, I'm going to lean on you a little bit. Were you, was the Pike still, I think it closed in the 50s or 60s? Oh no, it closed in the, uh, in the early 80s. Oh, in the early 80s. Okay. I didn't realize it went that late. Yeah. Um, so anyway, here's a picture of what Long Beach used to look like in the early decades of, of the um, um, 20th century uh, with a promenade, amusement park, et cetera, et cetera. Is it a question? Yes, ma'am. Why are all those people in the water if they weren't allowed to go in It's after cold. the Victorian era. Oh, after, okay. After oh, the 20s, right, sorry. After the Victorian era. Um, yeah, why are all those people in the water? Uh, surfing? I don't know. Um, maybe there's a, a ship out here that they're all swimming to. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, I want to talk about a couple of models of urban development. Um, many of you might be familiar with the Park Burgess concentric ring model. Um, I'm going to talk about two other influential ideas. Um, one of them is the Harris Ullman multiple nuclei model. So he sees the city as a series of uh, developments around specific nuclei or hubs. So one of them, of course, is going to be the central business district, where you're going to have a lot of your commerce and uh, administration, things like that. But another one is transportation centers. So beyond the fact that uh, uh, something like a port is in itself a, a, a major facility, um, it's going to have land use impacts that ripple outward. And, um, um, oops. First of all, ports have to, in the neighborhood, have a lot of port required functions. So where you have your port, you also have to have your ship repair facilities, or maybe your ship building facilities. And you have to have coal bunkers or oil tanks that, that fuel the ships, things like that. So in addition to the port itself, um, you get a lot of uh, facilities involved with servicing the shippers. Further beyond that, you get a lot of what's called port attracted industry. Um, is anyone here familiar with the term break bulk points? I know you are. Okay. Um, basically, and this doesn't just go for ports, uh, this might blow your mind. S throughout history, cities have tended to form at what are called break bulk points, which is where goods have to be taken off of one transportation convenience conveyance and put onto another. And those are natural places for other economic <coughs> activities to locate. <coughs> Um, so if you collect all your goods at one point and you're going to put them onto vessels or, or vehicles to go further, that's a good point to store those things, to trade those things, and to process those things. Um, and so a lot of the goods that are shipped through the ports, 
it makes sense to do their, as I just said, storage and processing right there in the immediate um, vicinity of the port. Um, for example, um, how many of you have driven on the New Jersey Turnpike? Um, okay, and you've seen the gazillion oil refineries, hideous uh, uh, chimneys with uh, rye products being burned off the top or whatever. Um, very common for oil refineries to locate right next to ports. Um, in, for example, it happens in the United States because the oil companies, a lot of the oil comes from sort of politically unsavory countries like Venezuela or Iran or Nigeria, where they don't want to build refineries right on the spot. But it makes more sense to do the refining as soon as the oil hits the, the, the shores of the United States. Um, also, there are also often economies of scale in processing. So it makes more sense to have one big oil refinery than to have every individual city have a little oil refinery. Um, you guys might not know this, but uh, New York City, its first economic reason for being was that it was the break bulk point for sugar. Um, sugar cane would be grown um, um, in, for example, the Caribbean islands in the southeastern United States. Um, but sugar refineries were among the biggest industrial um, um, uh, structures uh, in, in that era. Strong economies of scale made much more sense to collect all the sugar in New York, process it, put it on ships to England, than to try having each individual place that grew um, sugar uh, uh, process it. Um, in addition, you have other agglomeration economies. So those of you who have taken Michael Storper's classes, um, and if you haven't, I would totally recommend them. I thought they were like mind-blowingly good classes. Um, um, you get other things. So firms like being near other firms because, for example, there's knowledge in the air. They can learn things from their competitors. Or they share a specialized labor pool um, or a, a supplier base. Um, and in some cases, firms even directly partner with things like um, securing an energy supply or water supply or, or things like that. Therefore, non-maritime industrial activity um, often becomes dominant, not just in the port itself, but in the area, a wide area surrounding the port. And that's what would happen with the ports of Los Angeles. So San Pedro would ultimately include not just shipping and warehousing and lumber yards, but uh, a lot of fish canneries, a Ford plant, Procter & Gamble plant, etc. Long Beach also attracted a large number of industrial enterprises from chemical companies to ironworks, even an amusement park ride manufacturer. Um, and we talked about the discovery of oil at, at Signal Hill, and that attracted refineries to the area. So by 1938, there were no fewer than 10 different oil companies uh, refining oil in the area of the, of the uh, port of Long Beach. And then um, someone asked before about military. As I mentioned, 20,000 people were employed in shipbuilding, specifically military shipbuilding, um, um, during World War I. Um, whatever happened to, oh, uh, the Terminal Island Resort was called Brighton Beach. Um, whatever happened to it, um, they dredged the channel and used the silt or whatever to um, expand Terminal Island, and then all the resorts and homes of the wealthy were too far from the beach, and so they all moved away. Um, industry moved in, uh, especially fishing and, and canneries, and the village was repopulated by a large range of, of different ethnic groups and became the character that it is today, which is a multi-ethnic sort of working class community. This is what Terminal Island had turned into by 1931. Um, over time, um, a lot more industrial uh, activity would locate itself in the gateway cities. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Cities like Downey, um, where the Rockwell plant alone uh, at its peak employed over 30,000 people. Uh, here's a picture of what would become Rockwell in, in World War II um, building uh, airplanes. And even today, this area retains a lot of its uh, uh, industrial character, despite the fact that there has been a lot of deindustrialization de um, in the region, um, certainly since I moved here. Um, even the ports themselves are involved in um, promoting industrial activity. So for example, they jointly run this project, Port Tech Los Angeles, um, in order to attract uh, industry to locate in the port region. Okay, one more model of urban development I want to talk about is Hoyt's sector diagram. Um, Hoyt views the development of cities as not being concentric circles, CBD, lower class, upper class, things like that, but as a series of sectors that shoot out in different directions um, from the central business district. Um, um, does this 
Can anyone guess what city he had in mind when he came up with this diagram? Chicago. Yes! How'd you guess? I, you've heard the talk before. No, Can anyone who hasn't heard the talk before to guess um, uh, what city this is? He based it on Chicago. <laughs> does, does, it, does it remind us of any other cities we might be familiar with? Okay, we'll look at that coming up. Okay. Um, basically, what you tend to have happen, according to um, Hoyt, is that the industrial areas, which we've seen now have a powerful spur to locate near the port complex, um, tend to attract lower class residential immediately adjacent to the ports. Um, major reason is that originally, as you learned from Professor Taylor's land use class, um, originally um, poor people couldn't afford transportation and all had to walk to work. Um, Professor, will Professor Taylor, oh wait, I'm on the West Coast, I can call you Brian, is that right? Okay, uh, I, uh, it took me a long time to get used to being called Professor Morris and now uh, it seems weird to call you Brian. Um, 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 uh, so originally, people had to walk to work. Public transportation in this country started off as a private business serving rich people and turned into a public enterprise serving disproportionately uh, lower income people. Later, of course, there's a feedback loop where once an area is industrial and low income, things sort of feed on each other and, mute and reinforce that, that characteristic. So you have negative externalities in the ports, right? Noise, pollution, traffic congestion, uh, visual blight, things like that. That reduces land values and makes it differentially more attractive to lower income people. Um, they tend to move in. Um, 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 and uh, 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 yeah, at the same time, Wealthier residential areas tend to repel industrial. For example, because people band together to keep noxious land uses uh, out of their area and are more successful at doing so because they have more political clout because they're um, wealthier. Um, quote from, from Norcliffe et al. Socially and politically, this spawned two very different elements in the townscapes and internal geography of such ports. One links the arduous and dangerous business of building and repairing ships and hauling cargoes arose in the neighboring Dockland districts. Serving as both a dwelling place for poor workers and playground for sailors on leave, these districts became at once the most colorful yet rundown parts of the urban fabric. The other, characterized by conspicuous consumption in comfortable townhouses and edgy townhouses of the merchants and professional classes, was not only physically separated from the Dockland, but was also a social, aesthetic, and political world apart. Industrial Docklands were not the place the merchant classes chose to live. The town of San Pedro, this is a picture of it from around 1909 when it was annexed in Los Angeles, um, started life as a decidedly working class um, area. Some quotes I found about it, it was rude and crude and wild, a strutting male bastion of beer halls, loose women, and, and loose living with a reputation uh, uh, for drunken sailors. Long Beach uh, was much the same way. It was originally founded as a place for workers at the San Pedro ports and industrial facilities to live. Um, <clears throat> Nationwide, this trend holds true as well. Um, a study of the 10 largest port districts in the United States shows the area around ports <clears throat> pretty much always has higher poverty, lower unemployment. Um, areas around industrial ports generally um, tend to be um, the site of, 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 of lower income housing. Okay, here is the Hoyt diagram flipped over. Now does it re resemble any city that you might be familiar with? Yeah, so <clears throat> we got downtown LA there in the middle. And then going to the west, there's upper class Hollywood, Beverly Hills, West LA, Westwood, Brentwood, Pacific Palisades, Santa Monica, Malibu, Santa Monica, Malibu. And then going south, here's Long Beach and the Gateway Cities. And then here's low class residential going south, that might be South Central, Watts, Compton, San Pedro. And then up to the northwest, there's middle class that kind of looks like uh, uh, San Fernando Valley. Um, and then over here to the east, we've got East LA and Boyle Heights. Um, I would maintain that it's like kind of almost scary how much this actually matches the, the geography of Los Angeles, especially since it was devised to describe the development of, of another city. Um, Los Angeles, the, so now we're looking at the west side. Los Angeles founded in 1781. And Santa Monica, as we've seen, was founded around 1870. Initially, all of this area was empty. Um, now, I have dates sometimes of when development started in these communities, sometimes when they were incorporated. I couldn't find like when the first house in Hollywood was built. Hollywood incorporated, though, in 1903. 
Beverly Hills, 1914. Brentwood begins development in the 1880s, incorporated in 1916. Bel Air began in 1923, and there's UCLA in 1926. Holmby Hills, they started building, building in the early 1820s. Um, Pacific Palisades, they started building in 1922. And Malibu started to fill in after the beach at Santa Monica was all taken up, spurred by the construction of Pacific Coast Highway in, in 1929. So the point I'm going to trying to make is that first, this was established as the, as the pleasure beach, and then, oops, all of these communities, which are synonymous with among the most wealthy and glamorous communities in the United States, if not the world, filled in this area after this became the pleasure beach. Oh, and by the way, the, the, the model that I was talking about, he says that the zone of the wealthy generally tends to form along waterfronts that are not industrial in character. At the same time, looking south, so San Pedro actually, very first development in 1769, and there's Los Angeles. And then we get Compton, incorporated in 1888, Long Beach, 1897, Watts, 1904, Huntington Park, 1906. Um, south Central Los Angeles, actually, the migration of African Americans to South Central began in about 1900, um, after the decision was made to um, site, the, site the port. Um, Signal Hill, incorporated in 1924. So, originally, this became, this was downtown, and this became the industrial port, and all of the cities that filled in between downtown and the industrial harbor um, tended to be lower income communities. Um, so I would make the case that perhaps this isn't a coincidence. Perhaps the whole wealthy portion of the city was drawn like a magnet to the pleasure beach in Santa Monica, and the more working class areas of the cities were drawn like a magnet south down to the Long Beach San Pedro um, um, complex uh, down at the south. Um, to conclude, how am I doing on time? I'm almost done. Yes? What would you say about the branch of Palos Verdes and the Palos Verdes estates as sort of being that wealthy enclave right next to this? Trip? Yeah, you do sort of have that. Uh, that's a good point and sort of gets me to my, my next point. Um, okay. Today, um, a lot of port areas are seeing a revival. So certainly, like along the in the, the South Bay, you see wealthier communities until you hit that big stretch of of, of port. Um, I didn't have time. I cut a few slides out, but basically, what you've seen happening with ports is like originally they used to be right next to the city center because transportation between the port and the city center was expensive and onerous. Um, nowadays, you've seen ports a lot of cases migrating to other places. So they since we have trucks and trains. Um, a lot of times the port wants to go to a more outlying place where land is cheaper, where they have more room to expand along the waterfront, um, where environmental regulations might not be as stringent. And so a lot of the, the early ports located directly uh, uh, adjacent to city centers are being turned from industrial facilities into recreational pleasure um, um, facilities. Um, it's happened in places such as Boston, San Francisco, Baltimore. This is a picture of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Uh, I, I've never, has anyone been to Baltimore? Is it nice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was originally an industrial port. It's been turned into a, a, a mixed-use upscale development. Um, we were just in London over the summer, and we saw what they've done to the London in-town port, um, which they turned into a second downtown financial center um, type of thing. Um, and in fact, of course, Long Beach has um, um, uh, some recreational tourist things, the aquarium, uh, and here's the, the, the Queen Mary. Um, Long Beach is also home to the Blumenberg Taylor Estate. Um, this is a picture of the property that Brian and Abby have invested in along the beach at Long Beach. I found a picture of Abby. Is this Brian's son from an earlier marriage? I don't know who that handsome virile young go-getter is that I, that I've got a picture of. I think we're out of time. <laughs> we are out of time, and we're just about done. Um, still, though, um, I, I realize we're all urban planners, and we got into this field because we wanted to change cities. But something called path dependency is super important in urban development. Um, once things get along a certain path, they tend to be mutually reinforcing. And I would argue that it's very unlikely in the near future that um, the wealthy in Los Angeles are going to leave Beverly Hills and Brentwood and move to Compton and Watts. Um, things sort of uh, get into a certain rut and they tend to be reinforced. Models, simulation models of city growth 
show that the initial conditions are very powerful in terms of what eventually grows up. Um, even if those initial conditions were arbitrarily arrived at, as I've made the case that the, the um, court decision was. Um, so finally, a couple of lessons learned. First of all, geography is no longer destiny. So the cities on the East Coast, Washington, Baltimore, uh, not Washington, Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Charleston, all exist where they are and became major cities because they have great harbors. That's where they put the cities, and they would break bulk points because goods would be collected there and shipped on to Europe, and those became the dominant cities. Um, Los Angeles has naturally zero transportation uh, advantages. It's in a remote corner of the country. It's hemmed in by inhospitable mountains. It has no lumber, as we've talked about. It has no water. Um, yet it has become one of the major transportation uh, and logistics regions in the country and indeed the world. All of that is man-made, a product of the railroads and a product of our ability to build uh, man-made harbors where none um, um, previously uh, existed. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that I've tried to make the case for throughout this talk is the power of transportation facilities to sculpt urban form. Um, the facility itself changes the character of the area, and then all of the things that it attracts tends to um, put the area on a certain uh, path of development. Is it possible that if um, the port was put in Santa Monica today, Santa Monica and Pacific Palisades would be a uh, hideous industrial district and, and port facility, and wealthy people would all be living along the beach in San Pedro and Long Beach? Is it possible that the whole historical geography of the region would have been different, and that you wouldn't have seen the exodus of, of wealthy people uh, toward the west side, if indeed the terminus of the west side was, was a major uh, industrial facility. Obviously, it's impossible in historical research to test hypotheticals like this, but I think it is quite clear that if a battle on Capitol Hill between a robber baron and a California senator had gone a little bit differently in the late 1890s, Los Angeles would certainly be a very different place. And that's my talk for today. Um, and I'm happy to end the Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm sure this is like an entire course, but what is the governance structure of the ports and how is that related to the history? Is it like a port authority? I'm going to rely on people who are smarter than me to help me field some of these questions. The, the, the two cities, Long Beach and Los Angeles, each have a port authority that, uh, that manage the ports. Um, and so those ports uh, raise revenue and have to spend revenues in the ports. They can't use them as cash cows for, uh, for other things in other parts of the city. And that's they they each have a board of commissioners and they operate uh, sort of separately as sort of quasi independent uh, economic bodies. There's a lot of criticism of that model, and over time, they become less exclusively focused on commerce and more on environmental mitigation and the the, the issues and needs of the communities surrounding the ports. Uh, there's a whole long story that we can talk about about what's going on with the ports today. Um, so I've fallen out of following them closely in the seven years that I've been gone. Um, but they're doing a lot of environmental mitigation. So one, one major issue that you guys face as a region is that you get stuck with a lot of the environmental consequences of having these ports. And I hope it's been cleaned up, but when I was here, I saw gra uh, maps of uh, lung disease and they are elevated in Long Beach and, and San Pedro. So they've done a lot in terms of, of uh, for example, cold ironing where the ships plug into the electrical grid on the, uh, at the port instead of just running their engines constantly to keep the air conditioning and lights going. Um, they've done things such as um, try to spread the truck traffic out, so provide incentives for truckers to come in the middle of the night so that they don't get everybody uh, coming during the day. They've provided incentives for truckers to retire their older trucks and get newer trucks that meet the new particulate matter standards. Um, and the ports collaborate in, in all of this. Um, um, yeah. So I was just going to say, uh, we did say it would end at 1.15, but since uh, we got started 10 minutes late, if any of you need to leave at 1.15, that's fine. But why don't we stay 10 more minutes to answer, sure. answer questions? <clears throat> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, why why, uh, why did San Diego become a more prominent uh, port? I've, I've heard that it had to do with landside connections, is that while LA was at a disadvantage in terms of, of water facilities, 
the passage inland, especially for railroads, was, was I, extremely I, I, arduous, yeah. and the, the goods essentially had to go up into the LA Basin and then back out through uh, 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 the Beaumont Pass area. I've, I've heard that too, and I've heard you say that um, when I've said, why the hell is Los Angeles the biggest city on the West Coast when it has no harbor? It's the biggest piece of flat land on the entire West Coast. On the Pacific Rim. Pacific Coast, yeah. Pacific Rim. Yeah. Yeah, Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim. Even the um, Asian part? Yeah, it's the largest piece of flat land on the Pacific Rim. Yeah, so, yeah, no, but I heard that also earlier that um, San Diego is more inaccessible over land. So, but obviously San Diego be, did become a major harbor, but more for military uses than uh, 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 shipping. So, yes, sir. So, a lot of the development of, of the corridor down to the port also has to do with uh, redlining and, and the bulk uh, zoning. How much of that, like chicken and egg kind of thing, how much of that redlining was because of sort of the existing conditions there that then made, uh, you know, mortgages unavailable that then made it the only place that minority populations could live or vice versa, I suppose? That's a good question. I'm not super well informed about it. Uh, the only thing I could say is that it tends to be symbiotic. In a lot of cases, there are these feedback loops. So because the area has lower income people, um, 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 it uh, has less political power and is less able to zone out undesirable uses. Um, and as a result of that, more undesirable uses move to the area and that only degrades the quality of life in terms of things like pollution and, and, and noise and, and visual blood dust, things like that. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not really familiar with, in the context of this region, exactly um, where the mortgage lenders would and, and would not lend. Um, but as I say, as a general principle, path dependency in cities is really important, and things definitely become to become, you know, self-reinforcing. Um, oh, and then once you get the, the housing stock, once an area develops as lower income, I know people are very concerned about gentrification, but it's not easy to gentrify an area when the housing stock is very low quality. How, buildings generally last about 50 years, so it's not easy for a low-income area to turn into an area full of mansions, um, especially not overnight. It takes a, a considerable amount of time to do that. Yes, sir? Uh, yes. You're raising your hand? Yeah. Uh, I got to throw it in there, of course. Uh, I have kind of a background in California history. Okay. What is Port Bayona? come into this equation because it's sort of it's this site that's really in between I'd say Santa Monica and San Pedro of course it's now Marina del Rey what, where did that come into this equation of the possibility of draining these swamps in the 19th century and having this be the new port for the area okay I've read about this and it's been years I know it was a factor at one point and that stuff was being shipped in and out of there as well but I'm embarrassed to say I forget what I've read about it Obviously, it didn't make the cut among among the final two, so I, I, I know it was it was at one time a player along with these other two, but uh, it fell by the wayside, and I'm sorry I can't remember exactly. Uh, Marina del Rey was a huge undertaking in the '40s, '50s, and '60s to judge all of that. It was right, a massive sort of I guess pleasure port. Right, so right. To speak. That's of course also horribly polluted. You can see the oil skim on the surface of the water. Uh, but I just I wonder where that sort of fits into this, maybe a trio of ports in Los Angeles, the one that never existed, the one that's a pleasure port. At one time, there was some shipping in and out of there, and I forget who was doing it or why that site was not further developed. But yeah, at, at one point there was some shipping in and out of there as well, competing with these other two. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I guess I'm um, curious why the neighborhoods near the port in Southern California aren't poor, because I'm thinking of like at least the areas I know, like West Oakland or um, Newark and Elizabeth. Those are sort of very low income, whereas at least the neighborhoods immediately adjacent to the ports of LA and Long Beach don't seem that. I mean, certainly Compton and sort of above, but like Long Beach is an, a not not nice. Professor Taylor's in Bloomberg, You guys. Brian, Brian grew up in this area, so I'm going to defer to... to oh, Don, Don, Don Lawson. I was well, just born in Long Beach. Okay. Um, I mean, San Pedro, as I say, I showed you the statistics about the incredibly high home prices. Um, 
However, like, ethnically speaking, it's quite an ethnically mixed area, right? I think it's 70% non-white, uh, non, non, non-Hispanic white in San, in San Pedro. And certainly further north, typically what you get is like the waterfront land, yes, is going to be desirable. Um, but if you go even just a few blocks inland, um, it tends to drop off pretty quickly. Um, can you tell us any more about the character? You grew up there in Histori- the Historically, the, uh, the sort of ethnic white neighborhoods were in San Pedro, uh, Latino neighborhoods in Wilmington to the north, and African American neighborhoods in West Long Beach to uh, you know just immediately to the east of the port. But that that's historically how they kind of shaped where Snoop Dogg is from. Well, from Ca- 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 copied his name from Shoop Dogg. Uh, uh, well, he, he was born there too. He, yes, yes, he's from Long Beach. Is <laughs> anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming out on a Friday. I super- <laughs>